Okay, so um, yeah, uh, welcome everyone to uh, the SOAS World Philosophies Lecture Series. This will be uh, our 21st lecture. Uh, and um, we're very pleased to have uh, uh, Jonathan Flores with us. Uh, Jonathan is an assistant professor of philosophy at California State University and uh, does interesting stuff with in disability studies, um, philosophy of disability, of course, philosophy of race and pragmatism. And uh, your, your um, scholarship on pragmatism is very interesting because it brings together comparative perspectives, American pragmatism, uh, Japanese pragmatism, and I think we'll be seeing uh, quite a bit of that in your talk today. Uh, the theme of your uh, lecture is gender as affect a cross cultural aesthetics of gender. Uh, so, um, uh, Jonathan, you have the floor. Um, we we'll look forward to your talk. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, so, again, uh, the title of my talk is Gender as Affect or the Affect of Gender Cross Cultural uh, Comparison of Gender. And so, I'm going to dive right in because there's a lot to get through, right? So uh, in Isano Kami Sasume Goto, uh, Motori Norinaga argues for an interpretation of aware or the moving power of things that is closer in use to exclamations like ah, alas, oh, um, or other exclamations as in when one is like struck by a sudden feeling or and it must give voice to it. And so while Norinaga grants that uh, the poetic use of Aware in literature and, and aesthetics is closer to a sigh, which is usually a sigh of longing or wit or wistfulness, he maintains that the original use of Aware is in the form of an exclamation, which is a, a meaning that it hasn't lost despite its predominant association with a, an act of sighing and sadness, right? So as a result, Norinaga argues that the primary distinction between a sigh of sadness and other exclamations was the situated context of the aware or the moving power, uh, the affective quality that occasioned uh, the immediate response, right? An argument that he, he like develops through his etymology of aware from the original word aware mu, or to think with a sense of sighing, right? So for Norinaga, to think with a sense of sighing or aware to omu, uh, which is later contracted to aware mu, was to register the movement of the kokoro or the heart mind, uh, the center of affectivity and cognition in Japanese aesthetics, in response to the encounter with an event uh, in the external world. Now, to be clear, the uh, kokoro or the heart mind is not a uh, individualistic monad uh, monadic structure. It is not uh, an essential um, an essential form like the, the kogito or uh, similar concepts in the West. The heart mind is a inter or is an interrelated, interresponsive locus of thinking and feeling. So when one encounters an object in the world, one has both thoughts and feelings as uh, the uh, response of the heart mind to the external world uh, could be articulated both in terms of cognition and in terms of uh, affective response. Indeed, for Norinaga, there was no thought without a feeling and no feeling that di itself did not occasion some affective response, right? And this is something that Dewey, uh, that John Dewey develops later on in his, in, in his pragmatic aesthetics, particularly in so, so far as he argues that every thought for it to be named such has its own qualitative unity, its own affective organization. Turning back to, to Norinaga on this view of Awari Tomo is the articulation of a perception of the affective nature of the world through uh, the situated encounter with it and the Kokoro within it, right? So a sigh in this context is the response of the Kokoro to the encounter of the phenomenal world, which Norinaga articulates as being third deeply or in keeping with the language uh, or, or in keeping 
with a more pragmatist reading of this, it is the manifestation of the way in which emotion and thought arise within the kokoro as a locus within the experience of interaction with the world, right? So Norinaga's um, etymology provides, uh, or as grounded in an explanation, provides a uh, an important linkage with the aesthetic theories of John Dewey, specifically as the exclamation in the presence of profound aware serves to denote the underlying uh, aesthetic nature of experience, right? So this aesthetic nature for Dewey is made present in the qualitative unity of object in our encounters with them. Uh, to be overwhelmed in this context should not be limited to an articulation as, uh, of, or to an articulation of a specific feeling as given meaning through uh, a culture which enables interpreting some changes in they are our, our encounters with the world as sadness or happiness, right? Uh, for Dewey, these things are culturally supplied, a point which we will discuss a, uh, a little bit later. So despite making clear that a, uh, so for Norinaga, an individual uh, may not, or may simply, or an individual is not just overwhelmed by uh, phenomenal objects in the world, but they may be overwhelmed by social and cultural status or an individual beauty. Um, however, in making this claim, Norinaga does not provide a, a robust conceptual background for such experiences, despite their centrality to his uh, theory of aesthetic experience. Now, Dewey, on the other hand, engages directly with uh, the kinds of experiences articulated above, specifically that of being moved by the, the, uh, by the social status of an individual or their, their beauty, right? So for Dewey, when words are insufficient to articulate the encounter with the qualitative unity of a experience or an event, recourse is had to uh, say size and exclamations. However, these exclamations or what Dewey calls ejaculations serve to be the concrete symbol of a, uh, of a qualitative unity that unites a given experience. And in the, uh, in the slide uh, on screen right now, I've got a selection from John Dewey's qualitative thought that fully articulates uh, Dewey's meaning here, right? That is, the ejaculation is the symbol of an integrated attitude or disposition towards something, right? And so in this light, to be overwhelmed by aware is to be uh, overwhelmed by the qualitative unity of a situation of an object whose presence or aboutness is so thoroughly manifest in the uh, experience that it defies uh, the capacity for articulation through uh, explicit terms or what Norinaga calls ordinary language versus poetic language. So under a pragmatist reading of aware, words fail not because thought, is, thought fails, but because the aware of an experience is so thoroughly present that ordinary language is unable to adequately articulate and clarify the qualitative unity. So in this case, Norinaga argues that the composition of poetry or the creation of an aesthetic form is necessary to articulate the aware of the experience um, such that one can communicate what it is as, as moved them. And this is a point that Dewey echoes insofar as he took art to uh, intensify the qualitative unity of experience such that all who stood before it could apprehend it. So for Dewey, intelligent control over the materials uh, from which art is created enables the clarification and articulation of, uh, of turbid emotion. And so though, though Dewey doesn't use the specific language of clarification, he does grant that the articulation of a qualitative unity through intelligent control over the raw materials of a situation allows for the, for the resolution or the communication of the encounter in experience, uh, the break with the environment that occasioned an emotion, right? So implicit in Dewey's work is the thesis that the creation of, of art serves a, a similar therapeutic and communicative purpose as articulated by Norinaga. So for, or to this end for Dewey, right, um, uh, such, uh, such ejaculatory uh, kind of judgments apply the, 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 the kind of simplest example of qualitative unity and its pure, purity, right? So again, these ejaculations are the response of an individual when the aware is such that, that translation into ordinary language 
fails. It also demonstrates the depth of Aware in an immediate experience, right? Exclamations, as articulated previously, are the result of an immediate experience of an Aware such that it can be such that it can only be expressed in poetic language, which serves to clarify and make present uh, the initial uh, or the Aware through the intensification of the of the qualitative unity, such that uh, those who stand before the work can understand it, right? And so the inability to articulate the aware of an experience in ordinary language for Norinaga can be taken as an indication of the depth of the immediate, uh, the immediacy of an experience, specifically insofar as uh, a given encounter with the world speaks so completely for itself or makes present uh, its aboutness in such a way as to overwhelm the capacity for articulation, right? That is, uh, when we see a beautiful sunset, we, we fail to completely describe it except to say how beautiful, or when we have a delicious meal, uh, we fail to completely describe it in terms of, of flavors, uh, except insofar as to say that was so good. Um, so to this end, in keeping, um, in keeping with Norinaga, right, the aware of human beauty is the way that the aboutness of a given individual makes itself present in such a way as to overwhelm the capacity uh, to articulate the OARA within a uh, within a universe of discourse or the ordinary language supplied by culture. Right? This point bears uh, th th this point uh, is important because both Norinaga and Dewey don't admit of a difference between the moving power of human beauty or the moving power of natural beauty or other. Uh, other such situations, right? And Norinaga is more explicit in this articulation as beauty for Norinaga was encompassed the, among, under the widest range of experiences for uh, uh, of Aware. So Dewey, by contrast, reaches the same goal uh, by recognizing the commonality uh, of, of affective qualities and sense qualities within experience. Um, or you know, put another way, the common presence of aware within uh, activities uh, or within the integration of, of activities into a total experience, right? And so while this integration may account for the development of beauty through what do we call dramatic reconstruction or the ways in which we reconstruct experience as we have it, uh, or as, as a growth through the development of experience, do we also provide the language as indicated on the slide uh, to articulate the experience of being moved by beauty in an immediate sense. And so for Dewey, beauty is emotional in the sense uh, that beauty, when we, we apprehend it in our experience, is a, is a disruption in the equilibrium between, say, ourselves and, and the world, right? And so like all disruptions in, in equilibrium, uh, for Dewey, beauty likely presents itself as a shock or an emotional disturbance. Uh, or a vague feeling of the unexpected, right? Beauty can then emerge with varying degrees of definition or vagueness, uh, which serve to direct consciousness as an activity of the kokoro. Recall again, the kokoro is both a, a sensing, thinking, feeling uh, locus in experience, which enables us to reconstruct the, the situation in such a way as to enable it to, to make sense. And so for example, uh, one, in, in graduate school, I um, uh, in graduate school I officiated over uh, several weddings, and in each uh, in each instance, uh, the groom, when he saw his bride for the first time, said something to the effect of "How beautiful!" Right, and that exclamation encompasses the totality, the the complete wholeness of uh, his ex uh, of of his experience of love, of his experience. Of, uh, of seeing his bride in that moment, right? And so beauty is, as Dewey says, a just tribute to the capacity of the object to arouse admiration that approaches worship. And in this context, it is not a, it, in this context, how beautiful or beauty itself is not a term of analysis, right? Uh, and so to this end, uh, having said that, the striking power of beauty is not distinct from the striking power of other objects, nor is the process of reconstruction that the kokoro engages in distinct from other processes of reconstruction. So the ejaculation of how beautiful uh, in the, uh, of a groom in the presence of his bride is not 
fundamentally distinct from the, you know, the ejaculation of say how beautiful or expression um, when encountered with a, you know, the beauty of a sunset over uh, say uh, the, the tundra or in any other natural phenomena, right? So these are of the same material and experience, the situations which occasion them are different. And insofar as they are uh, of the same material and experience, right, they are also possessed of their own unique qualitative unity or aware. And so, um, insofar, as, uh, insofar as this is the case, right, um, the, uh, insofar as this is the, the case, uh, one of the reason, or sorry, I have lost, but insofar as this is the case, right, um, the ejaculation, how beautiful um, makes present the aboutness of an object in its immediate sense, right? And so beauty is, um, again, emotional in the sense that beauty apprehended in immediate experience is a disruption in the equilibrium established between uh, ourselves and the world. However, um, insofar as this is the case, the, the striking power of beauty is not distinct from the striking power of natural objects, which is a point that uh, Noronaga articulates in his critique of, of Buddhist monks, right? And so Noronaga uh, in Iso no Kame Sasame Goto uh, admonishes bu Buddhist monks for their insensitivity towards human beauty uh, in contrast with their praise of the, the natural beauty of the cherry blossom or the moon, right? So uh, for Noronaga, should the monk be insensitive to the aware of the moon and the trees and not to the aware of a beautiful woman is to engage in a mode of self-delusion as for Noronaga and Dewey, both the moving power of a beautiful woman and the moving power of the moon and the trees are grounded in the same material of experience and are both occasioned by the encounter with uh, the moving object through the senses, right? So again, for Dewey, um, for Dewey and Nor Norinaga, what this indicates is the capacity for the human form to immediately arrest ongoing perception through what Norinaga would call the sensuous charm that emerges from the integration of all elements of the human form and serves to mark those things uh, that are taken as particularly beautiful. And it is on this basis that we can start to think about gender as noire or an affective quality of persons. And insofar as beauty is an emotion, beauty becomes the pervading quality of a situation, person, or experience. However, to say the, that beauty is felt as an emotion is to uh, treat beauty as a relation of quality, right? And the ways of articulating beauty may change, specifically as an ex exclamation, as Dewey has told us, uh, sim quote, symbolizes neither a feeling, uh, neither a state of feeling, nor the supervening of an external uh, essence upon an, a state of existence but marks the realized appreciation of a pervading quality that is now translated into a system of definite coherent, uh, definite and coherent terms. We can actually talk about what the thing is we're experiencing, right? So this is all to say that uh, aware uh, is primary as a qualitative unity of not just objects and experience, but of uh, individuals themselves and the articulation of beauty as felt relies on a, a cultural world to give meaning to that felt beauty, right? It is the case that the Kokoro is moved by human beauty similarly, but the language that we use to articulate it varies across cultures, right? And so while, while beauty may subsequently draw forth an immediate response in the form of an exclamation, what is being explained depends on the culture or depends on what do we call the universe of discourse or the culture and the situation in which the exclamation is being made. And so to this end, right, um, to this end, a particular aware or quality of the individual can move the kokoro um, in the same way that, um, in the same way that, that the kokoro is moved to say being struck by a natural phenomena or a work of art. And this is, uh, um, this is something that is important insofar as aware is the pervasive qualitative unity of all things including persons. And here I have juxtaposed uh, Dewey's articulation of, uh, say, the qualitative unity of a, um, 
the qualitative unity of an individual in um, in qualitative thought with Richard Schusterman's discussion of personal style in uh, performing live. And so uh, insofar as this is the, the case, right, a person may possess an aware that marks them as distinct from others. This would be their personal style or the pervasive quality that Dewey identifies uh, as, say, John's style. Um, and this serves to organize individuals as this person or that person uh, and is grounded in the development of that person as an integration of a history or an integration of uh, their embodied habits. So this OR may also be, uh, be described as that which makes possible the qualitative unity of an individual's personal style. So if we uh, consider Schusterman who states having, quote, having a personal style cannot be a mere momentary affair, it implies a tendency to behave or appear in certain ways or a range of related ways and thus or involves disposition or habits that may imply repetition or, and enduring uh, over time. So for, so insofar as a uh, personal style is a integration of a history of, of, ab of, of habits of culturally conditioned actions, a personal style it, for it to be recognized as such must be the outcome of that integrated history that allows for the denotation of style as individuated by an integrated quality. Hence, we can denote something as John style, Marx style, Sarah style, so on and so forth. Uh, this integrated quality and its relation to experience can be described in Dewey's thought uh, through the example of, say, a, uh, a hypothetical interview between an employer and an employee, and certainly we've all had this experience, um, wherein the qualitative unity of the uh, employee is imaginatively projected into, say, the situation of employment, right? So in his description of uh, the, you know, the interview, Dewey said, indicates that a single emotional quality serves as the focus for the experience out of which other emotions evolve over, uh, over time, right? And in doing so, Dewey acknowledges that it is possible that each attitude and gesture, each sentence, almost every word to produce more than a fluctuation of basic, uh, in the basic intensity of the basic emotion uh, to produce a change in shade or tint in this quality, right? So to put, a, put this another way, the interviewee may be anxious during the interview and be unable to uh, suppress that anxiety, which is translated through the gestures made during the interview. These gestures then affect the overall tone of the interview. And Hi, Jonathan, can uh, you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? It's sort of uh, lost your sound. Uh, you okay. Um, let let me let me double check what's uh, what's happening with my sound. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, no? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, you still can't hear me? Here, let me, let me. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Okay, you can hear me now? Uh, go ahead, Jonathan, the others can hear. I think it's from my end. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Uh, Okay, so, so again, right, um, the, so to get back to, to where I was, um, what the employer does, right, so in the situation of the interview, right, the qualitative unity that uh, organizes the potential candidate is apperceived by the interviewer and then, um, uh, it was apperceived by the interviewer and then is projected into the situation of the interview or the situation of employment such that the interviewer can uh, judge the fitness of the interviewee for the position, right? So to this end, and the, the, this is what, what Dewey would call the disclosure of character, right? So in this situation, right, the, the interview employer imaginally projects the employee in the situation of employment to determine the degree to which 
the potential employee can function within the work environment, right? The character of the applicant thus disclosed through the emotional material of, 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 of the, the, the self as embodied in responses to their uh, interactions within the interview is imaginatively re reconstructed to function within a situation, specifically one with its own qualitative unity and therefore aesthetic character, right? So this imaginative projected you know, the interviewee is an integration of the elements of the interviewee's personal style together with their affective disposition, be it anxiety or confidence, arrogance or squeamishness that gives rise to the image of the interviewee as organized by a qualitative unity. There is this qualitative, or, qualitative unity or a worry that must harmonize with the situation employee uh, to determine the fit of the individual within a situation. So what we we do when we say that somebody is a good fit for a position is we have reconstructed the um, the individual uh, in line with their uh, through the qualitative unity uh, that they have disclosed as their character in the uh, in the situation of the interview such that uh, we can determine if the qualitative unity of the individual aligns with the qualitative unity of the work situation if they're going to be a good colleague. Uh, or or not right. So insofar as so in both of in both of the situations uh, described so far, like the aware of the given individual that marks them as distinct uh, serves to organize our perceptions of the individual in such a way as to uh, make clear the ways that aware or the qualitative unity of persons is made manifest through uh, their embodiment, right? Uh, this connects most uh, specifically to the understanding of Oari as a quality of a specific kind of person. Uh, that is to say, for Dewey, things like squeamishness, honorableness, um, conscientiousness, generosity are not simply uh, adjectival descriptions of an individual, but uh, qualities of a individual that emerge through the integration of their actions in uh, situations in which we encounter them, right? And so to this end, right, um, we might read this uh, back into Norinaga's argument that being moved by the rank of, uh, by the rank or status or bearing of an individual is, as Norinaga states, a natural and inelocutable sense of all before a person of uh, exalted station as opposed to an attempt to curry favor with that person. Now, to be clear, right, when we, te when we think about uh, nature, uh, we need to think about nature as uh, in the mode, or we need to think about nature pragmatically or uh, in the ways in which John Dewey articulates nature is not distinct from culture, a point which we will uh, take up momentarily. But uh, to this end, we should only understand that these, these responses are only natural within a cultural situation that has cultivated our uh, our kokoro and our affective sensibilities to be receptive to the ways in which positions of rank and status or consummations or qualitative unities develop through um, cult or through enculturation right um, now to be to be clear um, what is crucial about the above and kind of necessary to understand gender as affect, right, is the way in which uh, the aware of a an individual is a quality that is uh, that emerges within the situation in which we encounter them, um, and it is something that we denote within the limits of a given culture, right. And so, to this end, in the broadest sense. Uh, culture, or what Norinaga would call a world, is the the term used to refer to the variety of ways that humans engage in transactions with their uh, environments to satisfy their needs. Right in doing so, the hu or in doing so, individuals transform a physical environment into a cultural environment, uh, which is what Dewey refers to as a, a world of meaning and consequence through the ways that the physical environment supplies the means whereby. Um, individuals maintain their characteristic patterns of activities, right? Under this view, it is not simply um, the case that people are born persons, but become persons through enculturation, right? Uh, so stated differently, right? The cultural environment grows out of the physical environment, but is not in, 
identical with the physical environment, just as a, any other organism is continuous, uh, but not identical with its environment. Now, um, to this end, right, uh, this understanding of continuity is uh, crucial to Dewey, Dewey and Noronaga's understanding of environment as an individual can only be said to belong to an environment that supplies the means to satisfy the needs embodied in its outreaches to it, right? So if an environment is more, uh, so for Dewey, an environment is thus more than the physical space that an individual occupies. It is the ways that the that a environment enables the, the growth of an individual through transaction with it, such that individuals can be said to be part of the environment or extended through it, right? Um, to this end, the kind of physical environment that uh, individuals find themselves in will shape the kinds of transactions that an individual like engages in. So um, to this end, as individuals reach out through to the environment, the organism uh, or individuals acquire the means to resolve say a lack or a disruption in the environment, either through their own actions or through mere chance. And this returns it to the state of an equilibrium. However, uh, in returning to a state of equilibrium, uh, the individual and the environment are both changed. Now, to, insofar, now that is a, a kind of abstract way of, what, of describing what Dewey calls the organism environment continuity. But to place this in the result in different customs. the human organism reaches out to the environment to satisfy its needs, right? So I've provided a, um, a basic example of this from human nature and conduct, and um, which wherein Dewey describes the distinctions between uh, cultures. However, for Dewey, right, uh, culture broadly takes up or is, is made up of two interdependent elements, right? The material and the ideal, right? And the material elements of culture are comprised of artifacts, which include habitations, temples, uh, roads, means of transportation, other tools. Um, this also includes the ways in which artifacts are used, the practices that structure their use, and the technical processes of uh, that that result in their their creation. Right. So that is to say that the uh, to provide a, a, a specific example. The meaning of a, of a temple would be found in the various kinds of rituals performed within it and as the means of activities, or, and it is by the means of the activities performed within the temple that the temple acquires uh, like specific kinds of meanings, right? Uh, so to this end, right, a more contemporary example would be, uh, would be the organization of a Christian church, a Jewish synagogue, and a, and a Islamic mosque are all predictive of the kind of activities that take place within them. And their unique archi architectural designs and religious iconography communicate to members of a culture the what these buildings are to be used for and how they're to be used in line with the rituals and the customs of the religious space that has established them. Now, the ideal elements of culture are the, the moral, scientific, aesthetic, and political belief structures that determine the use of the material elements of the culture, including the materiality of our body, right? So the ways in which religious belief structures, for example, transact with the material elements of culture serves to form the ground of the varieties of fashions that express, say, one's cultural membership through, uh, say, the determination of, of how to display or use religious iconography, um, or the ideal elements may also determine the appropriate kinds of conduct to be performed in specific locations within a culture culture, they also may determine how we can deploy our bodies in transaction with one another, right? Um, and insofar as, um, uh, insofar as for Dewey, that culture includes the material, the idea of their reciprocal interrelationships, um, it is the environment that is organized through the interrelations between the material and the ideal that serves to enable humans to engage in the transactions that for Dewey form the mental and emotional disposition of behavior in individuals by engaging them in activities that arouse and strengthen certain impulses 
that have uh, certain purposes and entail certain consequences. And as these transactions are in continuity with the cultural environment and incorporate elements of those environment into themselves, this is why we can say we can point to different ways in which uh, individuals' actions are predictive of their membership in certain cultures, accents, uh, ways of moving through crowds, for example, modes of dress, uh, the kinds of individuals which are formed through transactions with specific social environments come to bear the stamp of their cultural environment that enabled their formation, right? Again, a person is not born a person, but becomes a person through a process of enculturation, right? And this, uh, this actually gives us the, uh, the ground to think th through gender as not only aesthetic, but a form of art, right? And briefly for, for Dewey, art refers to a process of creation. And in this mode, Dewey's use of the term art is similar to uh, the way in which uh, we might use the Greek term techne, insofar as techne intends a collection of skills aimed at production. In contrast for Dewey, the aesthetic refers to the ways that in which the results of art are enjoyed. Right. And so more more broadly, the aesthetic refers to the ways in which experience in general is perceived, taken up and qualitatively enjoyed. And here enjoyed is not restricted to uh, the ways that we have positive experience. Um, enjoyed is enjoy also involves say negative experience. Right. Uh, so essentially. Um, right. The aesthetic refers to the ways in which we take up and have an experience. Right. However, one of the concerns for Dewey is that there is no term that unites both uh, the aesthetic and the artistic, and thus, in in the broader context, there would there is no term to unite both the affect of gender and the activities that uh, that give rise to it. And this is where uh, Japanese aesthetic and Japanese philosophy uh, can make critical interventions. Right. So. The Japanese concept of dol, which we can provisionally define as an organized interaction with a social and cultural environment in which an individual participates in the aim of cultivating specific modes of engagement with that environment through the inculcation of skills historically transmitted as part of following a dol or a way. So dol are also codified historically through a narrative that connects the dol with a tradition beyond itself, which is embodied in the practice of a dole in society and serves to uh, and serves to organize it as distinct from other kinds of practices, right? And this narrative provides not only the legitimacy and authority for the transmission of these skills as practiced by a dole, uh, but also serve to maintain their author uh, the authority of the ethos of a dole um, through its practice. And finally, all uh, what is more uh, pertinent for this talk is that all dole involve the pra practice of kata or forms that habituate not only the body of the practitioner, but the, the kokoro, again, their heart mind through their repetition. In habituating the kokoro through kata, do enable the cultivation of affective sensitivities to the world, ways of seeing, experiencing, feeling the world um, as, uh, as say the example of uh, martial arts kata uh, demonstrate, uh, which enable the, the martial arts practi practitioner to respond non-consciously um, non -consciously to uh, stimuli in their environment, right? So to this end, mastery of kata is necessary for a given do, specifically as one of the functions of kata practice is to maintain the continuity between the do as practiced in the past um, and the present embodiment of the dough through its appeal to the lineage uh, uh, that the dough was connected to. So broadly, we might understand dull as specific traditional ways of being in the world, right? Um, a point which we can develop through, uh, through pragmatism, right? If we understand, say, the habits and somatic stylizations of, of a culture bear the stamp of that culture, then the practice of a culture also serves to cultivate sensitivity to other elements, other uh, practices within that culture as sensitivity to aware. That is, the various dole that come together there to form a given culture supply kata that align uh, an individual with that culture. And to this end, kata is not simply a methodology for cultivating uh, mastery of a given aesthetic form. It also so serves to cultivate 
into individuals specific ways of being in the world, right? And so Tom Kasulis presents the example of the, the kata of bowing, wherein uh, Japanese individuals are trained to execute certain um, uh, kata for, for social interaction, specifically in response to ver ver verbal cues, right? Uh, a, an example would be, as Kasula states, certain phrases are always used in uh, or are always accompanied by the appropriate bow and kata, so much so that Japanese people use them even when talking on the telephone. We can think about uh, other kinds of kata that are uh, more familiar to us, uh, the kata of raising a hand during a talk to signal attention um, or to signal that one has a question and so on, right? Um, and there are uh, there are a variety of other ways of uh, of of kata structures within culture uh, that I don't actually have time to go over. But the, one of the things we should bear in mind is that the habitual nature of kata inculcates a body of techniques of a given do. Uh, then the assignment of a do aimed at stylizing the uh, then the assignment of a do is aimed at stylizing the body into particular ways of, of being, uh, especially insofar as kata are not limited to uh, aesthetic practices. Again, uh, Jennifer, uh, one of the examples that uh, Jennifer Robertson gives is the, uh, the kata of, of farmers as articulated in agricultural ma manuals in uh, ancient Japan, uh, and which also extended to say, manuals for womanly conduct, right? And so there is a pragmatic connection here, right, uh, where Rich Richard Shusterman argues that this is part of the somatic stylization of a body, right? So we can, we can think about the kata as a somatic style unique to a socially assigned role, um, specifically insofar as, say, as Shusterman states, a policeman, a judge, a doctor, all possess different forms of authority, and they differently embody them, right? And success in their roles requires incorporating the right bodily attitudes and comportment whose mastery involves implicit mu muscle memory and spontane spontaneously performing them. Every role that we adopt in, in society, be it racial, gendered, cultural, all have their own katas, which enable us to be perceived as performing that role, right? And so, um, one of the things that uh, that Shusterman points out here is that insofar as the inculcation of kata also structures the kokoro as a semantic style, enables itself to, to be disclosed through action as an aware, a sense of who we are, it is important to note that kata cannot be so easily discarded, right? And here um, I've provided uh, an example of one, the kata of a given role that uh, inculcates one's body and um, uh, Shannon Sullivan's example of uh, frequent non uh, frequent non conscious smiling, which is part of the the uh, the kata of womanhood, right? And here we have our our we have finally getting to the part about gender as affect, right? And so, insofar as uh, insofar as uh, there are kata for social roles. I also argue that there are kata for, for gender. Judith Butler calls this uh, the repetition of citational actions, and Shannon Sullivan connects this to um, uh, John Dewey's habit. But one of the things that uh, understanding this as uh, understanding gender as kata or involving kata includes is the ways in which um, as the, is the ways in which gender as kata disconnects gender from the biological makeup of the body. Specifically uh, in the in manuals of conduct like Kaibara Ekans on a Daigaku, um, uh, the practice of the kata of womanhood could correct uh, maladies of, of personality of, uh, through the cultivation of the kokoro such that um, such that appropriate womanhood could be displayed through the ways that one embodied the affective constitution of womanhood, right? Um, and in this context, right, um, the kata served to articulate the aware of gender. And this is uh, this can be more thoroughly seen in the aesthetics of the onagata or the uh, female role performers and kabuki, right, who are uh, more 
specifically uh, described as ona rashi or possessing a likeness to uh, to womanhood, right? So uh, it is through the articulation of kata that um, ona rashi or ona gata uh, indicate a likeness to uh, the kata of womanhood or the proximity of the individual to the aware articulated by a kata that makes the kata distinct from other similar objects in the world. So a kata of womanhood, a kata of a given role is the idealization of the organization of the emotional material, the aware of bodies in line with a uh, cultural narrative which serves to articulate the body in its interaction with the world, right? The kata of gender subsequent, uh, so to this end, ono rashi uh, to be female-like was therefore to narrow the distance between the kata of ona, womanhood, and the kata of otoko, or uh, masculinity, or the body beneath it, um, in effect to articulate in a ware. So the kata of gender subsequently provides the behavioral uh, postures for the interaction of the gendered body with the social world, such that specific results are obtained through the embodiment of the attitude of the perceiver uh, in response to the control exercise over the, the body as material. So here we can think, turn back to, to pragmatism and its somatic styles of kata, as Shannon Sullivan describes smiling as an example of the ways in which the kata of middle-class white womanhood uh, or the aware of middle-class white wo womanhood is made present through the kata of a gendered body. And again, Sullivan's uh, descriptions of frequent non-threatening smile of smiling is one example of this uh this kata right so um it insofar as this is the case frequent non-conscious smiling uh articulates sullivan's embodiment as non-threatening in a qualitative sense when combined with the other kata of her embodiment as a middle-class woman right and so sullivan's description of smiling as part of the style of who she is reveals the structure of style as organized similarly to, to, to Do, and more specifically, insofar as Sullivan's habits are in, as she describes what she is supposed to do within white middle class, uh, uh, as a white middle class woman, pointing, if we point backwards from the presumption that she, she is supposed to stylize her body in a specific way to the codification of the, the Do or the way of white womanhood, uh, we can start to see the ways in which embodied habits give rise to an aware that aligns individuals with uh, both gender and race, right? So the do, which brings with it a specific kata, which is articulated by Sullivan, enables her to achieve gender sedimentation through uh, the way in which her cultural lessons inculcate womanhood through the practice of kata as lessons of how to be a woman in her cultural situation, uh, result in a particular apperception of her affective or qualitative unity, right? Um, and in this uh, in this mode, Iris Marion Young may uh, also makes visible the effect of gendered habits as kata when inculcated into the body, right? Uh, specifically in uh, throwing like a girl, it is the uh, Young describes the this inculcation as a totality of the bodily kata, which produce the affects of gender um, as vis-a-vis uh, -vis the practice of being fragile as inculcated into the, uh, to the young girl, such that the young girl comes to think of herself as fragile and subsequently will articulate her gendered embodiment in line with the aware of fragile femininity. Fragility here is a felt sense that is a, uh, of the body as, as fragile. Uh, as accompanied or as aligned with one's gender, right? And so if we understand this through the regulatory structure of gender, right, uh, it becomes clear that the regulation of gender through what Judith Butler calls citational act, what John Dewey calls habits, and what I have called uh, kata, is, has the effect of restricting the individuality of the gendered body through kata, right? As kata prescribed the ways in which a gendered body is to engage in transaction with the world, um, Kata subsequently informs the kind of persons that one uh, becomes. And crucially, right, Shannon Sullivan describes this in her uh, articulation of the integration of her gendered habits as a kind of style. And here, style should be understood as a style of dance, a style of food, a style of painting, a specific way of articulating an affective 
um, organization of a of a given in, event. And this is uh, also what enables the articulation of character in, in John Dewey as a sense of who a person is, right? And so for, for Sullivan, it's not simply that character as a generic um, sense of a person is disclosed through the integration of habits or the kata of gender. It is that, or it is that the person as gendered is displayed as a awar, as a qualitative unity through the integration of stylized habits, right? And so while I take, um, so in, in, this, in this context, the qualitative unity of the individual is what is made manifest when we encounter uh, another individual. And so on my reading, we might take character of an individual as a mode of qualitative unity, a mode of organizing the emotional or affective materials of the individual in such a way as to distinguish the individual from other persons. Uh, and so uh, insofar as this is the case, the processes whereby we construct other people from emotional materials are not distinct from the processes whereby we affectively construct uh, individuals as gendered. And so, so, and this, in my view is not distinct uh, from the processes whereby we affectively reconstruct uh, events through uh, our, our apperception of works of art, right? And so uh, insofar as this is the case, right? Okay, so insofar as this is the case, we might, uh, we might turn back to Richard Shusterman who says, quote, perhaps the most generic of somatic styles is that of gender itself, a feminine way of looking, walking, gesturing, sitting, and so on, as opposed to a manly uh, appearance or, or posture or style of movement, uh, which is to say that is the organization of the self from generic somatic styles of gender themselves supplied as kata through culture in combination with cultural, uh, cultural styles that give rise to the gendered subject, not simply as a member of culture, but as the result of an aesthetic process that makes present gender as a qualitative unity that unites a somatic style into a style and a person into a person. To be gendered on this view is to be the outcome of a process of incorporation and creative deployment of the generic somatic style supplied by the dole of gender or of a given culture such that the gendered self becomes intelligible as bearing the qualitative unity of, qual of gender as disclosed to the action or through its actions. And so to this end, individual personal styles are themselves creative organizations of the general somatic style supplied by a culture. And despite their creative deployment, they, they bear the stamp of that culture as a qualitative unity. So one is not simply a woman, generally one is a Japanese woman, an African woman, a white woman, and so on, right? And so to be to this end, it should be clear that the uh, the cultural habits are the means whereby the sense of a person is felt affectively through the organization of gender as somatic styles into personal styles as a qualitative unity of, the, of that person. In short, how the habit supplies by the imposition of a way of being a woman, a dole of womanhood, uh, are organized by the bearer of that dough within the confines of their culture that results in the person in the development of a personal somatic style uh, that is apperceived affectively rather than discursively, right? So that said, um, the function uh, that said uh, the function of of, of dough as kata is to organize the emotional materials of the self into a self that is both gendered and gendered and raced and sexualized qualitatively. And so the function of a doe is not only to produce an individual that aligns with the broader culture, but to make visible the, that individual affectively um, as the outcome of the integration of their habits. Uh, so uh, I think I'm running short on time here. So to, to conclude here, right? Um, one of the things we should bear in mind uh, is that while treating gender as a qualitative unity that unites a somatic style, um, as uh, the unites a somatic style, which is integrated into the body, reemphasizes the affective nature of gender. It does not imply that gendered habits are easily changed or that they're a veneer that can be adopted at will, right? The habits and somatic styles that make up the material itself are not interchangeable. They are, uh, nor are they, uh, they are the re repetition of habits that are not freely chosen by an individual, 
nor are they the completely determinant of who, who an individual is. As they are creative taking up of habits of those supplied by a culture, there exists the possibility to do these habits differently, such that new qualitative unities, new possibilities for doing gender emerge through from how these somatic styles are taken up and combined under social pressure, right? Uh, to that end, right, it is only upon reflection upon the ways that an individual creatively deploys the somatic styles of gender that subversion or disruption of gender is denoted and prop prompts processes of inquiry to resolve the problematic ways in which gender is done uh, that emerge in the, uh, the encounter with a subverted uh, qualitative unity of gender, or what G Dewey might call the aesthetic disappointment uh, in the somatic stylization of the individual, which gives rise to questions about gender uh, or a question about a given individual's gender. To that end, it is questions about gender are fundamentally aesthetic questions about the constitution and organization of an individual's qualitative unity and not necessarily questions about an essential self. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Are, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I, I agree. Hear you just right. I, I have no idea what's happened there. there. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot. That, that was, um, yeah, a lot of facts, you know, in, in yeah. an hour. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and yeah, thank you for that. It's quite a number of interesting uh, ideas that are quite similar with sort of sub-Saharan African understanding of personhood, for example. Uh, how mm -hmm. how fluid it and normative it is, right? Mm -hmm. Being a human being, an ontological person, well, ontological being with ontic features is quite different from being a socially constructed mm -hmm. normative person. Yeah, um, yeah, in interested. Well, obviously, I have to take my time and listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, if you have any question, please do feel free. Um, Raise your digital hand uh, or pop something in the chat um, and let's engage with uh, Jonathan before he starts his day. <laughs> More <laughs> fully. Yeah. Uh, perhaps I, I, I could start. I was um, uh, putting something down while you were speaking. Um, mm. Is, is um, um, that overwhelming? Um, I worry. Um, is it is it purely subjective um, to the extent that you you can't collectively feel it? Is it purely subjective, or is it possible for it to be intersubjective? Um, so, for example, is it quite similar to one's religious experience or vision? For example, um, mm -hmm. something something you experience alone and uh, or is is there a possibility that um, one could that could be a collective experience of it? And if it is purely subjective, um, how do you express it to someone else? I, I don't know if my question is making any sense here. Oh no, no, that that makes complete sense. Uh, I, I think you're asking if uh, if our experience of Omoare is is only local to ourselves. But, or if it can be experienced um, like broadly, and uh, the answer is, is uh, it, it can be it it can be intersubjective uh, in the larger work, right? One of the ways in which our, our our felt sense of gender is organized is through um, uh, is through Sarah Med's affective economies, where a an affect a quality. Uh, qualitative unity is circulated among a group of people such that one is oriented towards or away from certain bodies in their affective or qualitative uh, presentation. Their, their aware orients us towards or away from, uh, from one another. I, I give the example uh, of, of how this happens through Franz Fanon's uh, description of the ways in which whiteness constructs the black body out of a thousand different so, uh, stories, right? And so this is the circulation of an aware and a, a qualitative unity of the the black body. So it's that it's it's dangerous. It it uh, you know uh, it, it's it's dangerous. It possesses a an inherent primitivity, so on and so forth, right? 
that emerges from the ways that these narratives are circulated through through a uh, a white supremacist society or a society that is organized through the colonial project, such that the oware of the black body is apperceived in a specific way. Right, and, and so this is one way we can have a collective uh, experience of the oware of an in individual, right? And Sarah Med's work gives plenty of examples, right? Um, as does Audre Lorde's. Um, and in my, my, in my book, uh, in the chapter where I more fully flesh this out, one of the things that I point out is that they, in response to the awareness of this oware, uh, different groups develop uh, stylizations of the body to um, avoid or uh, disrupt that aware, right? So my mother told me to take my hands out of my pockets when I walk into a store so as to not be perceived as in line with the uh, aware of Black folks as criminals, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So it is possible for, mm -hmm. for the, these sort of collective thing, experiences to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, the Pfizer, uh, forgive me if that pronunciation isn't right there. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, so um, my name is Riza. Okay, thank and you. I'm a student. Uh, I'm actually new to feminist philosophy, and I don't have much um exploration or, yeah, I just done something in aesthetics by myself, So, but I didn't had got a chance to get a scholarship. But still, I'm um excited to continue my education or like to the feminist aesthetic exploration. But when I read about uh, new works, but I don't get uh, much works to be explored. So I need a um, few suggestions from your part. Well, another question is that like related to that kata. Um, mm -hmm. um, excuse me. OK, um, like. Uh, it kind of give me a new insight because I just have read few works uh, of Baru's Beauvoir or Butler, mm -hmm. but from their metaphysical understanding also, I started to question about the aesthetic. So uh, in the traditional understanding, mm -hmm. we can see there is certain, um, like there is a certain political standards or political neutrality uh, mm -hmm. regarding the aesthetics. So, uh, but still, um, like we always associate uh, aesthetics with the emotion. And even mm -hmm. if we are traditionally considering it, the emotion will be attributed to women, uh, mm -hmm. it is not corresponding to reason. But still, however, when it comes to aesthetics per se, this emotion is kind of transcendent to the reason aspect. So I started mm -hmm. questioning about that. Now your uh, like exploration give me an another understanding about how an embodied a situated being their bodily actions their continuous action can be related to uh like our yeah in butler's language the performations or performative mm -hmm. acts so that's a new insight but um yeah it thank you for that but uh it would be very helpful if you are able to give me a suggestions of reading of, uh, as an introductory Sure. Yeah, that's that's uh, fairly simple, right? So, um, if you're looking for a a, um, a reading that bridges the uh, the the affective and uh, say the the sort of uh, cognitive in feminist philosophy, most of the a lot of the feminist phenomenological tradition does that. Uh, one place you might look is. Um, so Audre Lorde's work uh, in Sister Outsider uh, does some work with this, but uh, so does uh, Sarah Ahmed in The Cultural Politics of Emotion and Queer Phenomenology, where it comes to like embodiment, um, Shannon Sullivan's Reconfiguring Gender um, also does a fair amount of this, of, of this work. Um, so those are all the, off the top of my head, those would be like my first general suggestions. Um, uh, one of the things that is important to bear in mind when we're reading Butler is that uh, Butler's work proceeds from taking up Austin's uh, speech act theory and then applying it broadly. And some of her later work uh, beyond gender trouble undoing, uh, so for example, undoing gender and uh, some of her uh, her recent work, I think, where she 
is talking through Whitehead actually engages with some of the aesthetics. But um, I would say Shannon Sullivan's um, reconfiguring gender with John Dewey uh, is a good place to start uh, with that. And uh, you know, Richard Shusterman's work in, um, in Selma aesthetics also is, is valuable here. Of course, your, your own work, uh, yeah. <laughs> which Fiza you would find in the uh, in the poster, uh, the, the full title and publishing. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Fiza. Um, so I think uh, let me check the chat. Um, so yeah. Um, any other question? Um, final question before we call it a day. Okay, um, amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan, for yeah, um, yeah. for coming. It's it's a, it's been a pleasure. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm sure um, quite a number of persons will be able to watch it once it's on YouTube and um, mm -hmm. and engage with it. Uh, and of course, um, you do excellent work, really, uh, in this area. <laughs> thank, thanks yeah. a lot. Thanks yeah, a lot. Thanks, thank Elvis. You. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do have a lovely day over there and uh, have a lovely <laughs> weekend, everyone. Um, take care. Bye. Bye. See you next Thanks. time. Bye. Bye.